Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, so the board met in closed executive session where we called our meeting to order uh, so we can begin our meeting. Uh, tonight, we're gonna begin with a special public hearing and presentation on harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Uh, and that will be presented by Dr. Lee McDonald. Dr. McDonald. Check the microphone there, okay. Good. Good evening, thank you, Ms. Juliana. Uh, I'd like to present to you the semi-annual report on harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Uh, this report is required by the Par Department of Education to be presented to the Board of Education in a public hearing uh, twice a year. Uh, as we begin the report, we always like to re-clarify the definition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, uh, which you'll see up here is a, really a four-prong approach. Uh, in terms of the Department of Education's definition. Uh, there has to obviously be some sort of gesture, written, verbal, physical act, could be electronic, something has to happen. Uh, it has to be reasonably perceived as being motivated by an actual or perceived characteristic. It has to take place on school property, uh, school-sponsored function, a bus, uh, off school grounds, provided there's some sort of nexus with the school. Uh, and it has to substantially disrupt or interfere with the orderly operation of a school or the individual or group rights of students. Next, I'd like to look at our data. Uh, and this data is specific to the fall reporting period as defined by the Department of Education. That covers from July of uh, 2021 through December. Uh, if you look at the data here by category, overall we had 87 investigations. 44 of which were founded, 43 were unfounded. Um, those, uh, anytime we do an investigation, uh, they're either founded in meeting that definition of HIV or not. Um, this percentage is roughly 50-50. In terms of the grade level investigations founded uh, July to the December 2021, uh, you'll see here our peak is at the middle school, 50 case, 50 investigations. 23 were K-5, 14 at the high school. This, this mirrors our data that we've seen in the past uh, since we've been required to report this information going back to two, uh, 2011. Uh, and that middle school, you typically see uh, that uh, bell curve type um, statistical result. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about why that is. In terms of HIV investigations by location, uh, you're going to see here that uh, many of these act, uh, investigations for occurrences happen during unstructured activities. Uh, that could be at the bus, the playground, uh, it could be an internet incident, social media, hallway, lunch, um, you name it. While some do happen in the classroom, many of them happen uh, when there's probably the least amount of supervision. And again, this is consistent with, with what we've seen in the past. In terms of HIV investigations by the distinguishing characteristic, again, going back to that definition of HIV, um, when you look at your kind of traditional categories, race, sex, disability, sexual orientation, religion, uh, those are small in comparison to other distinguishing characteristics, uh, which really could be just about anything. Um, included in that category is 20 other appearances. We you know, separated that out to just uh, acknowledge the reality of something to do with a particular individual's appearance when it comes to that data. Again, this is very similar to what we've seen. Uh, at the school level, ultimately, administration will work with the anti-bullying specialist to kind of disaggregate that data a little bit more to look and see if there's any patterns or concerns. In terms of the ethnicity of uh, the victims, uh, overall, uh, you can see the categories, the Asian, at 40, Hispanic 7, black 15, white 28, multiracial 4. Um, this does, while not exactly a match with our district uh, population, in terms of student population, it does mirror in terms of the uh, distribution of what our student population entails. So overall patterns and trends from this data from the fall, um, Clearly, investigations are up. If you looked at our data over the last 15, 18 months, it was significantly down. Obviously, with the full return coming off the pandemic, <coughs> coming off a virtual spring in 2020, going to a mostly virtual model, albeit hybrid, um, in the 
2021 school year. Um, it's fair to say that investigations uh, are up and that we expected that, uh, especially in light of the fact that you could say that social emotional development of children during the pandemic, um, being remote, not necessarily have the same structures, expectations for behavior, routines that our children get while they're in school uh, has led to some dysregulation, has led to uh, behavioral challenges, but we're working back and supporting our students to address those accordingly and to make sure that we're setting those expectations for behavior. Founded, unfounded, it's about 50-50 when you saw in that first data slide. Um, this is a little bit lower in terms of the percentages being more equal than we've seen in the past. I attribute a lot of this to, um, you know, we have a fair amount of new administrators. We've retrained, we've recalibrated, if you will. When in doubt, if something comes forward, we're going to investigate it. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to investigate something um, and to make sure that it's addressed appropriately. Um, the middle school cluster that you saw before, again, when you think about adolescent development, uh, the search for self, uh, the search for who am I, uh, what do I want to be, a lot of those things happen at that middle school level in terms of overall development. And again, that's a very consistent pattern with what we've seen in the past. Other distinguishing characteristics, again, very similar to the data that we've seen, um, that is not necessarily race, religion, sex, gender, sexual orientation, and whatnot. So something to do traditionally with somebody's appearance um, is at the basis of those investigations. And unstructured activities, as I mentioned before, playground, bus stop, online, where there's the minimal supervision, if you will, that continues to be a pattern and trend that we've seen with our data. So just shifting gears and highlighting what are we doing about this, right? How do we address uh, bullying in our schools? The number one way to do that is to make sure you have a positive school culture and climate in every building um, and that you are setting expectations for behavior. You have conversations with students, with staff about relationships, social emotional learning, building connections, uh, positive school culture and climate starts in the classroom. So those are things that we've set up to do from day one and we continue to do that work even during the pandemic we found ways to move forward with our school culture and climate teams uh, this is a data sample of the database inquiry cycle that we follow uh, traditionally we would have some sort of focus group or uh, school climate survey to uh, look at uh, particular school climate categories in every school our teams would actually work to look through that data they would have conversations with students of course with faculty with parents to segregate that data to come up with some sort of action plan um, and some sort of way to address any sort of um, challenges with school climate and culture. So there's a lot of different things that we do along those lines. I'll give you an example. This past week we had a equity week at High School South uh, that was well received and just emphasizing some of the work that we're doing as a district around uh, equity and inclusivity, which very much relates to school climate and culture. Um, here are some other examples of our school climate and culture supportive actions. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. As I said before, we have climate and culture teams in every building. Um, we're going to continue to have our climate and culture summits uh, this spring, looking at that data that I spoke of a minute ago. Um, our SACs, our student assistance counselors, our Rutgers University behavioral clinicians do great work with our students, especially from middle school and high school. We have uh, behavioral analysts that work with students in many different ways. We have school-wide assemblies that address climate and culture. We have conversations with students to honor their voice and choice in the classroom. Um, you name it, uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that our students have a positive school culture and climate. I mentioned the summit will be another uh, thing that we will continue to do. Uh, we're slated to have our teams come back together in the spring. Though that may be virtual, we've been able to do that during the pandemic to have conversations about the climate and culture in each and every building, to share strategies, to talk through action plans, um, and to assess kind of where we are with our school culture and climate. To that end, I'll leave you with our mission statement that we established back in 2011 uh, with regards to anti-bullying Bill of Rights. Uh, number one, adhering to the law, right? Making sure that we have clean investigation process, making sure that we're training our Board of Education, our staff members, uh, making sure that we're setting those expectations with students and parents um, and that we're sticking to uh, what this is ultimately all about, which is creating that positive school culture and climate and addressing challenges head on. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Are there any questions from uh, members of the board for Dr. McDonald? Okay. okay, thank you. So at this time, we'll have a special opportunity for public comment, and this is just on the harassment, intimidation, and bullying report. So the board invites thoughts and reactions on the harassment, intimidation, and bullying report from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 15 minutes. So are there any comments to, uh, specific to the harassment, intimidation, and bullying report? So hearing none, I will close this public comment portion. Uh, I'll now uh, need a motion to approve the July 1, 2021 to December 31, 2021 District Semi-Annual Report of Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying, uh, Robin and Graylin. Any questions or comments? Okay, Chris. Okay, we'll start with Ms. Vonzel. Here. Ms. Chenera. Yes. Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Dovitz. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. And Ms. Juliana. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that will adjourn uh, the special public hearing on harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And we can now return to our regular public meeting. So uh, before I do, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Toscano, who is going to amend our closed session discussion. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just one quick item. Uh, the agenda for the meeting was printed uh, uh, on Friday prior to the weekend. Uh, there was uh, two items uh, that just need to be corrected. One was a matter that was not discussed in executive session. One is a matter that was. Uh, the board did not discuss HIV matters, which is listed under exception number nine. Uh, and the board uh, did discuss uh, under items uh, number seven, uh, the current uh, board vacancy. Thank you, Mr. Rossano. Okay, so we'll now go back to our regular meeting. And I just uh, first just wanted to start by welcoming everyone uh, out here. Welcome to our meeting tonight. Um, this week, as most of you know, marks our first week of full day in-person instruction uh, for 2022. And that's after three weeks of our half day in-person instruction. Um, you know, we've seen a decrease in the COVID positive cases that that has made this possible. So we're really fortunate that that's the case. Uh, I did want to just start by first saying, uh, you know, I wanted to thank our administration, our superintendent, our principals, teachers, nurses, and support staff for everything they've done. Um, this has really been such an incredible amount of work and thought, uh, of work, and a lot of thought and analysis goes into these decisions. Um, they've spent countless hours uh, not just developing the plans, but also implementing them. Uh, they work tirelessly to give our students really the best possible education during really challenging circumstances right now, as you all can imagine with, with the pandemic. Um, they've found a way to stay open in some way, really, in the last two years, um, and always did this while looking out for the safety and overall well-being, including the mental health uh, of, our, of our students and staff. So I did want to thank um, all the administration, teachers, principals, nurses, everyone who made that possible, so, so thank you. Um, I did wanna also say thank you to our parents, to our parents, um, our WWP community, uh, for your patience and your support and for adjusting to a lot of these schedule changes. You know, we know it hasn't, it hasn't been easy. Um, you know, we board members, you know, we're parents too, and so we get it, right? We understand how hard this has been we have the same concerns uh, that many families in our communities have. Um, and I know we can't always agree on the best learning model, uh, but I know that most of us can agree uh, that our guiding principle should always be what's best for our students and what's best for our staff. Um, so know that all the decisions that are made by this administration and by this board always has that in mind. So again, thank you to, to all our parents and the community for, 
for the support and the patience that you've shown in these last three weeks, but really the last two years. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say, I know we've had a lot of parents and community members who've asked how you can show or help or show your support. Um, you know, really, I think, you know, we, we can find ways to support each other, right? I think I would encourage, and there's a lot of opinions that are shared and questions that are asked, and I, you know, we appreciate that. I would just encourage, I would encourage that those are done in a constructive way, um, you know, even if we can't always agree. I know that we as a community can stand together and work together uh, as a community. So again, you know, I, I, I uh, welcome those opinions and I just ask that we be done in a constructive way. If another more direct way actually, I know that others have asked how you can help, is to consider applying to be a substitute teacher. I know we've, we've actually said this a number of times. I think some of our board members have said this. Uh, if you're a college graduate, you're eligible. Um, school districts across the state uh, you've probably heard this on the news, um, including ours, are really hurting for substitute teachers right now. I think our substitute pool, I think, is down by almost 90, uh, 90%. Uh, so if you have the time and you'd like to help out and like to be, you know, help out our community and our kids, I'd ask that you consider uh, applying. So thank, thank you for listening, and I'll, I'll turn over to the doctor. Thanks. Julia, thank you, and uh, thank you for the kind words to the staff and the administration. Uh, good evening, everyone. So tonight we have an exciting opportunity to welcome uh, and go through an interview process for a board vacancy, and, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking through the process we're going to undergo tonight. Uh, but, but before we do, I just want to again say thank you to West Windsor um, Health Department. Uh, Jill Swanson and her team have been just tremendous partners, and I'm proud to announce that tomorrow we're going to um, announced some additional vaccine clinics that will be held actually right here in this facility um, on Wednesday evenings and late afternoons evenings in the month of February. Uh, we're going to start with two clinics and we'll expand if needed on both the 2nd of February and the 9th. We'll be sending out a letter tomorrow uh, to the uh, members of the community specific for our 12 to 18 year olds for boosters and specific to 5 to 11 year olds for a first shot series and or if they had a first shot and never received a second and needed, needed a place to come. So our health department has been gracious enough to host the clinic here. Also a thanks to Penn Medicine, who just this past Friday and Saturday um, administered over 600 shots, um, booster shots to high school and middle school students over at High School North, um, again, Friday and Saturday of this past weekend. So again, a, a lot of healthcare partners have done tremendous work to support the school community and thank you to, to them. Um, in addition to the comments, the State Department actually just recently changed the substitute criteria to 30 credits um, and it, I think it was a two-year waiver if I remember correctly. So um, believe it or not, uh, you can actually apply to be a substitute teacher with 30 college credits, uh, fingerprint clearance, uh, which we help you facilitate, and um, COVID, uh, I see Mark moving the mic, so I'll pass it to the board attorney. There was also the new legislation that was just passed that does allow for uh, retired, retired teachers also to apply to be substitutes uh, and still be able to uh, not jeopardize their pension, still draw their pension uh, salaries. So uh, there was a recognition in the New Jersey legislature that exception used to only apply uh, for superintendents, business administrators, and other uh, administrative positions. But in light of this staffing shortage, they have taken action within the last week to open that uh, option up to retired teachers. Right. And it's not just a substitute, but to actually fill vacancies and as a, as a teacher um, in a tenure track position, um, as well as for retired nurses to, to come back out um, and open up opportunities for nurses. So I know there's districts that are tremendously hurting. We are as well uh, when it comes to vacancies. As you can imagine, um, trying to find a mid-year maternity leave position in a high need certification area like culinary arts, physics, ma uh, multivariable calculus, I see our math supervisor here, right? There, there, there are areas that, and, and those used to be the hard ones, now elementary teacher is, right? So now every certification area is a high needs, um, difficult shortage area that we need to really be mindful of. So we, we do have um, those particular um, areas to think about. With respect to this evening's process, um, we, we do have um, 13 individuals that have applied to be considered for the vacant board position in West Windsor. 
Uh, I, we have been notified specifically of one candidate who will not be able to attend this evening. And we were just, I was just notified at six o'clock of one candidate that has withdrawn as of 6 p.m. this evening. So tonight we will have 11 individuals that will be interviewed. The one individual that's not attending but has submitted because they haven't officially withdrawn, they can still be considered for the vacancy based upon the, the information that's been submitted uh, to date. And, and the board will not have the opportunity to hear from them because this is the only opportunity for the interview. Um, as we go past um, some other board business, we do have some additional components of the evening's agenda, uh, including uh, presentation of co committee reports and then the consent agenda items. Uh, we will then um, move towards the interview process. And with respect to the interview process, um, with the 11 candidates that are here, we will literally pull the order out of, out of, a, out of a box with names on a piece of paper. You will see the slating of of the six person panel than the five person panel so that it's, it's random. Uh, I'll put the box on the table and let Ms. Juliana pick the order. Um, and then we will go through a series of questions. Uh, every candidate will have the opportunity to make a, a three minute public statement. You will see the names of all the candidates listed on the, on the screen uh, behind us. It will literally say candidate one and then the name. The way we listed the names was completely alphabetical with the exception of the one individual that told us they were not coming tonight, they were withdrawn and considered candidate 13 just in case they showed up tonight and had a schedule change. So you will, you will get a candidate number essentially. We will put the, the name plates in front. The Board of Education will move from the, from the front and move into the audience. We're gonna do that because the way the mics are set up and they're daisy chained, we wanna give you social distance from each other. We wanna give you access to the microphones and we'll have the six members right across the front. We'll have one panel. We'll take a five minute recess or so, and then we'll start the second panel. When those two panel interviews are completed, uh, we'll have an opportunity to, the board will essentially recess into executive closed session where the board will consider the candidates and, and uh, the information that's been heard, the resumes, the, the cover letters, and, and the interviews. And then the board may choose to come out and will definitely come out, but the board will come out and then inform the community of either that um, there's gonna be additional closed session and at another meeting or that they're gonna make a recommendation or, or there'll be a recommendation or a motion made by a member of the board. That process will play itself out. If you think of it in terms of the first slate could probably take about an hour after the closed meeting, or excuse me, after the meeting is moves to new business, which is the interviews, I figure panel one will be about an hour, five minute recess, panel two will be about an hour, and then the board will move to, everyone's welcome to stay. The, the live stream will continue. Um, and then the board, when the board comes back out, uh, the board may choose at that point to make a resolution uh, or a recommendation uh, has to be moved and seconded and then voted on. As long as there is a majority of the whole, um, which is five of the eight voting members, then the first individual that receives five of eight is the new elected board member. It's not, uh, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not multiple nominations, correct? No. It's, no, the process will be uh, will be voted on in, in nomination. So the first name that is nominated and seconded, there will be a roll call vote. If that name receives the requisite five, the process is ended. That's the person that fills the vacancy. Uh, the only caveat is uh, the person cannot be sworn uh, in tonight uh, because uh, under the Department of Education's uh, requirements, uh, we are not allowed to swear a new board member in, and it is give them the oath. Uh, until the criminal history background check results are in. So, uh, you know, we would endeavor to have that completed um, for the meeting after, you know, the, the board takes its vote. And it's, I believe it's supposed to be conducted within 30 days. It has to be done within the first evening. 30 days, yes. And, and again, we will work with that candidate to help, um, and, and Ms. Cheney will specifically work with the candidate to help get the appointments and, and take care of the paperwork process. So, so with that being said, uh, I do want to just address that um, in a recent township council meeting, it was intimated that the Board of Education does not have the right to move into closed session to have deliberation regarding the board candidates. Specifically, a member of the council suggested that, that the district was in violation of an OPMA or Open Public Meetings Act violation and alleged that we were conducting something illegally. Normally, I wouldn't take something on like this on publicly but it was stated at a public meeting. 
and the record needs to be corrected. And to correct the record, I'm going to turn to the board attorney and ask Mr. Toscano to please address that. Sure. So the Board of Education as, as a public body is, is governed by, uh, among other laws, the Open Public Meetings Act. Uh, that law has been in place since 1975, uh, has had some minor revisions here and there, but the basic gist of the law has remained consistent. Um, one of the key components of that law is there is a listing in, in the law of nine topics that a Board of Education is permitted to discuss in executive session, that is, to discuss outside the purview uh, of the public. One of those, uh, number eight, uh, is matters involving, and I'm just going to paraphrase, the appointment of any specific prospective public officer. Uh, an appointed member to a Board of Education is considered to be a pers specific prospective board officer. That exception, uh, a modified version of that statutory provision, has appeared on the Board's agenda uh, ever since uh, our firm came to start working with the Board uh, in 2015. Uh, so it is identified within the law itself. Uh, I would also point out, just to allay any concerns, that uh, the issue of whether or not a Board of Education or a public body uh, has the ability to discuss uh, the candidacy of a prospective member uh, in closed session has been addressed by the courts on no less than five different occasions. 1976, 1984, 1989, 2019, 2020. And in each one of those court instances, the courts steadfastly maintained that a Board of Education or a municipal governing body, uh, so long as the interviews of the candidates are conducted in public and the process is conducted in accordance with the bylaws of, of that entity, the Board is permitted to deliberate in executive session. A lot of time and effort and thoughtfulness went into the process that the Board utilized tonight. Uh, there was a focus on not only what is legally required, uh, what is also required by our applicable bylaw, which is available on our website, but also with a mindfulness of consistency in terms of how the Board has handled vacancies in the past, to utilize the same process in order to maintain a level of fairness and consistency. So just to allay any concerns, the process that is being utilized tonight is compliant with the applicable laws and is compliant with the Board's bylaw. And Mark, if I can take that one step further, it's also a best practice identified by New Jersey school boards. Yes. That's and correct. in the 13 years that I've been a member of the administration at central office, we've had three such board vacancies. Uh, two of those members sit here at the table this evening and Louisa Ho and Rachel Juliana. And in all three instances, this is the identical process that we followed proceeding with public interviews and proceeding to closed session for deliberation, followed by the public vote. So we have followed a consistent process. Uh, there are um, three members of council that were board members. One of them was the board president at the time, then Ms. Ho was the uh, appointed candidate. That's a process we followed at that time when that individual was the board president. So it's been a very consistent process. And quite frankly, the fact that it was stated that we were follow not following the law is an insult to this board of education. Mr. Toscano, I appreciate you rectifying and correcting the record this evening. And with that, I'll close my comments. Thank you, Dr. Adderhold and Mr. Toscano. Okay, so we're now going to turn to the first opportunity for public comments. The board invites thoughts and reactions on agenda items and items of concern from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 60 minutes. Are there any public comments? Uh, good evening, Linda Jeevers, 20 Hawthorne Drive, Princeton Junction. I'm speaking publicly tonight uh, to the board only as a resident and not as a West Windsor Council member, so my comments are my, are my own. Um, sometimes attorneys have differences of opinion We've had public processes at the council level for vacancies where a similar process where we interviewed candidates, we could ask questions, but then it was decided on advice of attorney, and our attorney may not agree with the school board's attorney, that it should be done under the Open Public Meetings Act. 
the deliberation should be public. Uh, it's not a personnel decision. You're deciding on someone who is going to represent uh, the West Windsor residents and also the Plainsboro residents. So I don't know if you're forced by law to go into executive session or whether you have the choice. Um, but if you feel there's a choice, then I would just um, urge that you do uh, openness in government and allow for a fully open process um, so that the public can see how decisions are made. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay. So hearing none, I'll close the public comment session. Uh, we'll now turn to our Board of Education Committee reports, and I'll start with the Administration and Facilities Committee. Uh, Dana? Hello. Oh, is, is this working? Okay. Hi. Um, oh, I get to go first. Go second. Um, Okay, so the ANF, the um, Administration and Facilities Committee met on January 18th. Um, first, Dr. McDonald provided an overview of administration and facility to the to the administration. Uh, sorry, excuse me. In an over, an overview of administration and facilities committee, while highlighting frequent agenda items, including their view of Board of Ed. Can I interrupt you for a moment? Do you mind bringing the microphone a little bit closer to the Um, okay, I will start again. We met on January 18th. First, Dr. McDonald provided an overview of the Administration and Facilities Committee while highlighting frequent agenda items, including the review of Board of Education policies and regulations, agreements and contracts, updates regarding the referendum, school safety and security, human resources and athletics, and the district strategic plan for equity. Next, we reviewed the 2023 2024 academic calendar, which will get a final Board of Education approval in February. Additional stakeholder feedback was discussed with the committee. As for an update on athletics, in order to proactively reduce event capacity due to the, due to the pandemic, the district spectator policy has been updated to limit tickets to four family members per student athlete. The district's application for a cooperative high school softball program has been approved by the NJSIAA effective for the spring of 2022 season. WWP will also be hosting this weekend the Mercer County Swimming and Diving Championships at High School North. We will be practicing with appropriate health and safety protocols and live streaming for spectators through WBCB, um, which is a radio station if you wanna listen. Um, Spring sports registration opened via the Genesis pa Parent Portal from January 18th through February 22nd. The committee also congratulates the High School North Winter Boys Track Distance Medley Relay Team who have been crowned the Group 4 State Champions. Next, we discussed updates to the referendum projects. Final push, punch list items for the HVAC update, upgrades at High School North and Community Middle School continue to be completed. Masonry, plumbing, and fireproofing for the dance studio at High School North continues. At High School South, mechanical piping, ductwork, and insulation is underway in the, in the new main office. Plumbing fixtures at in the science rooms have been installed and inspections are scheduled. At Community Middle School, the new weight room, fitness center, and team rooms have received final inspections and have been turned over to the district. Renovation of the new band room, which is the old media center, is underway. Pre-installation and planning meetings for the Wyckoff addition and renovation continue. Next, we had an update on DEI, which is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Members of the diversity, equity and inclusivity team and school administrators are facilitating professional development experiences on the intersection of social emotional learning, which is um, our strategic goal three, and equity, which is the district's goal four, during the January faculty meetings. Preparation and planning for a district-wide celebration of 
Black History Month is in February is underway. Finally, we reviewed a schedule of tentative ANF committee dates for meeting dates for the for 2022 and 2023. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, February 1st. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members? Okay. So our next report is from the curriculum committee. Lloyd. Thanks, Rachel. Um, the curriculum committee met on January 18th. Um, Dr. Nathan shared the district option two data with the committee and discussed ways in which the district is working to open alternative bath pathways for students. Discrete math, for example, is a course that we'll be running this summer for students who are interested in exploring courses that the district does not offer during the school year. Start Strong was also discussed. Dr. Nathan shared a draft version of the Start Strong data presentation. Uh, the presentation will be delivered to the board during the February 8th board meeting. Uh, on the agenda for tonight for voting are several resolutions. First, the New Jersey Department of Education requires the completion of the English Language Learner Three Year Plan. The district submission consists of a series of answers to questions provided by the Department of Education. The questions ranged from student achievement on assessments such as the NJSLA and ACCESS to staff certifications and professional development to support ELL students and their families. The curriculum committee recommends the approval of the ELL three year plan. The committee also recommends the approval of the community education spring summer 2022 youth programs. There is a, an extensive list of those programs in the agenda tonight for you to look over. There are also two courses, wait, two 2022 summer courses, <laughs> Uh, to recommend for approval. Uh, the first is the online district financial literacy course at a cost of $350 per student. Upon successful completion, students will receive two and a half credits. Uh, the second course is the district's uh, discrete math course at a cost of $500 per student. And upon successful completion, uh, students will receive two and a half credits. So the curriculum committee does recommend the approval of the summer financial literacy course and the summer discrete math course. Um, to recommend the approval of the disposal of the following obsolete items in accordance with R7300.1. And these items will all be from the media centers in the district. So 134 books from uh, High School North Media Center, uh, 1835 books from High School South, 256 books from CMS, Community Middle School, 503 books from Millstone River, 571 books from Maurice Hawk, and 1,876 books from the Wyckoff Elementary Metal, uh, Media Center. All items meet one of the, f or more of the following criteria. First, they are so outdated as to no longer serve as worthy instructional tools, or second, they are so worn or and or damaged as to preclude effective use and economical repair or restoration. So the curriculum committee does recommend the approval for the disposal of the instructional materials. Last but not least, some wonderful news. We'd like to acknowledge and congratulate Ms. Courtney Dignan as the winner of the Human Armstrong Elementary School Award. This is made possible through the collaboration between the American Association of People with Disabilities, the Coelho Center for disability law, policy, and innovation, and the uh, equal opportunities for students. As part of this award, the district accepts four iPads to be used by Ms. Dignan's class at Village. The district will also facilitate a pass-through award of three books on ableism to every student in Ms. Dignan's class. The curriculum committee recommends the approval of the donation, and again, we congratulate Ms. Courtney Dignan on this um, wonderful award. So congratulations. And the committee will next meet on Tuesday, February 15th. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Are there any questions from board members? Okay. All right, we'll turn to the finance committee report. Okay, the finance committee met on January 18th. The committee reviewed the proposed agenda items for the upcoming board meeting, including the financial reports for the month. On the agenda are motions to approve some state contract and cooperative vendors, approved purchases using shared services, 
and approve a change order for Grover Middle School construction for unused allowances, decreasing the project cost by $27,000. There are also motions to approve the disposal of obsolete equipment, approve some transportation items, authorize some professional development, and accept $233,820 from the New Jersey Schools Development Authority for emergent and capital projects to facilitate students' return to in-person education. Staff provided updates on construction projects, starting with projects funded by the referendum, Staff reported that fire alarm installation continues at Community and South. A revised fire alarm proposal is being reviewed for the work at Wyckoff. High School North and Millstone River HVAC replacement is nearly done. They are working on the punch list. There was an issue with the heating system at Millstone. A bypass valve was open that allowed water to bypass the boilers, thus not heating the water. The problem has been resolved. The High School North Dance Studio is progressing nicely despite supply chain issues. Work is flying along at South with the installation of mechanical piping, duct work, and insulation, along with the above ceiling electrical work. In other areas of the South Addition, installation of drywall, insulation, and plumbing fixtures continues. At Community, after final inspections, the weight room, fitness center, and team rooms have been turned over to the district. In the old media center, which will be the new music room, structural steel and metal decking are complete, and interior masonry walls are being constructed. In other areas of CMS construction, casework and furniture are being installed, and floors are being polished in preparation for turning these areas over to the district. At Wyckoff, the footings for the expansion are dug, filled with rebar, and awaiting inspections prior to pouring of concrete. There is one area where there is a conflict with existing plumbing, so concrete will be poured in all areas except that area until the conflict is remedied. Exterior material colors are being chosen and loose furniture orders are being planned. Staff also provided updates on the energy savings improvement projects. Project work is complete with final commissioning and training of district employees occurring building by building. At community, submeters, which are required for the energy rebates, are being coordinated. Change order work has begun with the energy return ventilation unit replacement at Village. Work on the other change orders should begin in March when equipment is on site. Next, staff briefed the committee on buildings and grounds issues. Staff notified the committee that the format of cleaning inspections has changed since each building has an operations lead person. Advocate, the district's inspection company, has trained staff on what to look for to complete the inspections. Training staff on the inspection process has been a challenge because the program is new and the district has experienced schedule changes due to COVID. Inspections will occur three times during the year. The district will be going out to bid for trash and recycling services soon. The district sold 135 solar renewable energy credits on January 12th for $31,185. Staff provided an update on cafeteria operations. In December, an average of 5,600 lunches and 350 breakfasts were served daily. Due to the half-day schedule for the past three weeks, the district is expecting a decrease in meals served in January. To date, we are averaging 2,400 lunches and 140 breakfasts daily. The food service program is purchasing new food warmers for Dutch Neck and Hawk. The district is awaiting delivery of a new walk-in freezer for Dutch Neck and receiving quotes for new walk-in refrigerator freezers at Millstone, Town Center, and Village. The district submitted a grant for $71,276 to the NJ Department of Agriculture for various kitchen equipment. Send Hunger Packing distributed 100 gift cards of $25 each to needy West Windsor Plainsbury elementary students. The federal reimbursement rate under the current program will increase from $4 and 42.55 cents to $4 at 66.5 per lunch and breakfast will increase for, it's really weird to say this, for $2.46 and a half cents to $2.60 and cents per meal. The committee received an updated calendar for the development of the 22-23 budget and there will be a board retreat on February 17th to review the budget. The committee reviewed potential committee meeting dates for 2022. Committee dates will be posted on the district website as they are confirmed. Dr. Adderhold provided an update on school health and safety. 
He shared that the district's COVID cases are trending down this week as compared to the last several weeks for both staff and students. Daily staff absences are decreasing. The district plans to return to full day in-person instruction on Monday, January 24th. Over the long weekend, the district had some issues with burst pipes at Dutch Neck, North and Wyckoff due to the cold temperatures. There was also a fire alarm issue at Village. In anticipation of the cold temperatures, the district's facilities department was on a 24 hour watch, enabling them to catch the leaks quickly so they did not affect school operations. The committee is next meeting on Tuesday, February 15th. Thank you, Louisa. Are there any questions from board members? Okay, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna turn to the voting portion of our agenda. Uh, we'll begin with administration, uh, administration items one through five, plus the purple addendum. Uh, can I get a motion on those? Uh, Dina and Liz, any questions or comments? Okay, Chris. Okay, we'll start, start, we'll start with Ms. Chenera. Yes. Ms. Ho? Yes. Ms. Krug? Yes. Ms. Maliga? Yes. Ms. Dovich? Yes. Ms. Bonsall? Yes. Ms. McEwen? Yes. Ms. Juliana? Yes. Okay. Motion's carried. Okay. All right. Turn to the curriculum items, items one through seven. Can I get a motion on those? Uh, Loy and Pooja. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug? Yes. Ms. Maliga? Yes. Ms. Zovich? Yes. Ms. Bonsall? Yes. Ms. Chenier? Yes. Ms. McEwen? Yes. Ms. Juliana? Yes. Okay. Motion passed. All right, so I'll need a motion on finance items one through 13. Uh, Louisa and Grayland. Any questions or comments? Chris? Okay, we'll start with Ms. Krug. Yes, except for, um, I'm gonna abstain on 13A. 13A, okay. Okay, Ms. Maliga? Yes. Ms. Zovich? Yes, but I'm abstaining from, um, it's C1A, please. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. you. Next is Ms. Bonsall? Yes. M Ms. Chenier? Yes. Ms. Ho? Yes. Ms. McEwen? Yes. Ms. Juliana? Yes. Can I get a motion on the personal items one plus the green, pink, and blue addenda? Uh, Dana and Pooja. Any questions or comments? Okay, okay we'll start with we'll start with with Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Chenier. Yes, but Ms. I'm. Ho? Yep. Okay. I have to abstain on. Um, the minutes for the 14th, December 14th and 16th. Oh, oh, we're, oh we're not there yet. Oh, we're, okay. yeah. we're no, that's the next personal. one. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. So next we have Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. So we're going to go to the approval of the, the Board of Education minutes. Wait, uh, just go back. I think you skipped me, so I was a yes. Okay. <laughs> so. Motion passes. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so we go next to the approval of the minutes. Uh, can I get a motion on those? Uh, Loy and Louisa. So uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Um, any opposition or abstentions? I have to, I'm abstaining from um, E and F, January 4th. Okay. okay. Any others? Mm -hmm. A through D. Okay. And one more, I think. And I'm abstaining from A through D as well. Thank you. Okay. Don't notice. Any board liaison reports? Yes, I have a liaison report. Sure. Can you hear me with my creaky mic? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this Thursday night, the Mercer County School Boards Association is hosting its winter meeting online. Our feature speaker is Vince DeLuca, who is the educator in re residence at the New Jersey School Board Association. He will discuss inherent bias. If any of my fellow board members or even the administrators here have um, heard Vince speak before at maybe at the NJSBA annual conference, he is a phenomenal presenter and is a wealth of school board, school administrator, and even a New Jersey, he was even a New Jersey mayor for many years. 
As the Mercer County president, I'm reminding you to please register for the meeting if you can attend at 7 o'clock on, um, online on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. All right, we'll now go to the second opportunity for public comments. The board invites comments from members of our community who are present. Each participant is asked to give his or her name and address prior to making a statement, which will be limited to three minutes in accordance with board policy 0167. All statements shall be directed to the presiding officer. This public comment period shall be limited to 15 minutes. Are there any other, are there any comments? Okay. okay, hearing none, we're gonna close the second opportunity for public comments. So I think now we're uh, at the board member candidate interview section, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Idaho. Great, uh, um, so we're, we're at the point of the meeting where I think the majority of the uh, room is here for. Um, and, it, and this is one of like your last opportunity to leave and, and reconsider uh, before we go through the process. So again, thank you to all the um, candidates there. Again, the 13 individuals that submitted, the 12 individuals that have continued through the process, the 11 individuals that we believe are here this evening. Um, clearly there is only one seat for the Board of Education, but it's highly encouraging that so many members of our public are interested in uh, supporting the community, supporting the schools, and no matter what happens this evening, we want to thank all the members that um, have submitted, and we would encourage you to please stay involved, whether it's at your local PTA or PTSA or, or at the district level, whether it's on committees or volunteerism within the schools. Uh, but again, thank you to all of you uh, for being willing to go through the process and be willing to, to, to consider uh, volunteering to the school community. With that, we have um, tw uh, 11 names that are in here. The candidate number four, and I'm going to just switch this on the screen, There's a reason to bring a backup computer. on the hard drive.
not an HDMI cord in the wall. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. All right. <laughs> okay. Forgive that. All right. So these are the candidates. My apologies for the, the delay there uh, that have submitted. Uh, candidate number four, as I said, withdrew at 6 o'clock this evening. So just as withdraw or withdrew, because that actually already has the numbers assigned in the box. Um, I, I have removed that from the box. We are going to pick the first six names. They will be slated right across the front here. We do have name placards that will be placed in front. Um, so the Board of Education and the administration will uh, move to the seats. Mr. Toscano is gonna move to the podium. He will then um, facilitate the uh, opportunity. So um, we wanna be respectful of everyone's name. So we're gonna just say the candidate number across the front. We want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself Prop, you know, so we don't. So we want to respect the pronunciation of your names, um, and want give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the school community. Um, I would say that if you'd like a bottle of water, there's water in the back. Please, by all means, grab a bottle if you want to come up here. Again, it's a little hot under the lights, and it's going to be about an hour for the first panel. If you think about uh, an opportunity for a question, and in three minutes, Dr. Nathan is in the back. She's our assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction. She has a timer clock that's going to run. For the first three minutes for every candidate we're going to ask the question to introduce yourself to the board or to the community candidate the first candidate selected will start the process with the introduction and they will go right down the row question number two will be asked to the second candidate that's slated and right down the row finishing back with the person that goes first and then we'll keep proceeding in that manner and then when we're done with the process we'll go right back to um, start all over with a five minute recess and start with the, the final five. Best wishes to all of you. Thank you again for your willingness to, to serve our school community. And with that, I'm gonna ask Ms. Juliana to pull uh, names. So we're gonna pull six. Just candidate number. Candidate 11. Candidate one. Candidate six. Candidate ten. Uh, two more. Candidate five. And candidate eight. All right. So that was candidate eleven. Candidate one. Candidate six, candidate 10, candidate five, and then candidate eight. So that will be our first panel sitting uh, right to left. And then we're just gonna pull the next set of names, um, numbers in, so we have the order for that group. Um, do, you, do you wanna pull the next set just that way we have the order? Second group will be candidate nine. Candidate seven. Candidate three. Candidate 12. And candidate two. All right, and just reading that back, and it's gonna go sort of uh, stage left to right. Candidate nine, candidate seven, candidate three, candidate 12, and then candidate two. So I'm gonna set the name placards across the front. I'm gonna ask the members of the Board of Education to please take a seat in the audience and invite the board candidates to please come up to the front.
Thanks for making a note. Okay. Can everybody hear me? All right. So, uh, in accordance uh, with the procedure that the, the board has, has set forward, uh, each candidate uh, will be given uh, three minutes to make their uh, opening statement. Uh, we will begin with candidate number 11. So, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the board, uh, Dr. Adderhold, as well as the West Windsor Plainsboro community for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit about myself as well as why I think that um, I would be a strong candidate to sit on the board. Um, a little bit of background, I grew up in New Jersey, the daughter of immigrant parents that went to public school in New Jersey, and from a young age, um, the value of education and how it can really impact um, futures was instilled in me. Um, when my husband and I decided to start our own family, we decided to move to West Windsor and one of the reasons was um, the, the strong school system in West Windsor and Plainsboro. So both of my sons have been in the system since kindergarten. Um, now my youngest is an eighth grader at community middle school, and I have a 10th grader currently at high school north. So throughout their years here, they have experienced different academic programs and social experiences. They are also heavily um, into sports. So our family has been very involved in West Windsor community sports, as well as in the school system. And raising student athletes really has um, enforced my strong belief in how important it is um, to be able to balance academics, uh, extracurricular activities, as well as social experiences to really develop the whole child um, through education. Um, my passion for education um, also continued. I have a master's in psychology as well as an educational specialist degree in school and community psychology. And I'm proud to say that I myself have been a public educator for over 20 years in another school district. Um, I'm well versed in special education code, HIV policies and practices as well as student codes of conduct um, for general education as well as special education students. On a daily basis, I work with students, parents, educators, administrators, whether that's um, sitting in on IEP team meetings, I run the crisis team uh, response at the high school, I give um, presentations on suicide awareness as well as help develop the risk assessment procedures for my district and um, I really see how equity um, is very important in our school system. I've always been a strong advocate to support all students, um, whether it's based on race, gender, or special education status. So overall, public schools has been an important part of my life at every stage of my life. So I not only want to give back, but I also want to pay it forward to future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Candidate. Number one. Thank you, Shweta. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to the superintendent, uh, this administration, and the member of the Board of Education, thank you for hosting here, us here tonight. A special thank you to all the candidates who are shown up here. And uh, you have shown a keen interest in volunteering your time to work for our learners in the school district. My name is Raj Afle, and I look forward to contributing to the success of the WWP school district and our learning community by bringing my diverse perspective to the school board. I have twin boys, and they're a handful. <laughs> so um, they're currently at village school, and um, we, came, we moved to West Windsor when they were in their first grade at Dutch Neck. So while we were at Dutch Neck, um, I volunteered there as a PTA volunteer with my wife, and um, it was amazing. I think it was amazing to see how moms and grandmoms and women in our community, we're providing our children with so much positive experience at school. And these are the same folks, uh, mind you, who are full-time moms, caregivers at home, or full-time at work. So one reason for me wanting to serve is to step up and support our women volunteers, and also inspire more dads. And I'm glad to see some, some guys here to join me in this effort. This led me to join the Village PTA Board 
and I'm currently the village PTA board's president. And being a PTA president allows me various opportunities to interact with the school administration, PTA board, and our diverse parent community. Secondly, I believe being a board of education member is one way that I can continue to contribute to the school district in a broad manner and be part of the whole child concept, where we want all our students to be as well-rounded as possible. My educational background consists of masters in computer science and MBA from Monmouth University here at Shore, uh, uh, West Long Branch, New Jersey. My professional experience is over 12 years in large financial banks in New York. I have also extensive experience in handling multi-million dollar budgets and resources. From what I understand, the current open board position is most likely part of the finance committee, so my training Education and professional background will enable me to analyze financial documents and collaborate with board members to inform the district's decision making and implementation of policies. Taking into account the current pandemic situation, the two areas of priority for me would be the district's strategic goal number three, which is the health, safety, and well being of the whole child, and secondly, to support and improve communication between local leadership, teachers, and parents. In conclusion, I want to thank, take this special opportunity to sincerely thank all our WWP teachers, administrations for their tireless work and effort towards the success of our students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Candidate number six. Good evening, school board, members of the district administrative team and members of the community. My name is Doug Larkin, and I wish to serve on the school board for the vacant position because I feel I have a great deal to offer, not only as a West Windsor resident and parent of district students, but as an educator and educational researcher as well. I started my teaching career as a student teacher at Community and South in 1991, and subsequently taught as a high school physics and chemistry teacher for 12 years in Hamilton Township, Kenya, Papua New Guinea, and Trenton. I earned my master's and doctorate in curriculum and instruction from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm currently a tenured full professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Montclair State University, where I have worked for the past 12 years. I am a teacher educator and educational researcher with expertise in science education, teacher education, and issues of equity, diversity, and justice in schools, and have published two books and over a dozen peer-reviewed articles on these topics. I'm currently leading a research team with funding from the National Science Foundation on a multi-state study investigating factors in teacher retention. My interest in educational equity has led me to work in school finance, labor contracts, and data systems, any of which I'd be more than happy to discuss further. If appointed, my first priorities would be to support the district's health and safety efforts during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and sustain the attention on educational equity and fiscal responsibility that the current superintendent, administration, and board has promoted. In terms of new priorities, I would like to be a part of both the thoughtful response to the challenges posed by the ongoing pandemic, as well as building the new normal of what our schools are going to look like in the years ahead. In particular, I'll share these two ideas. First, I would like to investigate the possibilities offered by the growth of online learning approaches in the district. We have a new tool in our educational toolbox to tackle some familiar and persistent issues, including addressing the mental health and socio-emotional needs of students, transportation, chronic absenteeism, specialized curricular offerings, supporting students with special needs, and responding to research about adolescent sleep requirements. All have posed barriers to student learning and well-being even before the pandemic. Second, in the spirit of the first and fourth goals of the district's strategic plan, I would like us as a district to find better ways to leverage the cultural resources of our diverse community into our schools. For example, I believe we need a much stronger approach to developing our classrooms and schools as multilingual spaces, and I include American Sign Language here. In a similar vein, our current district performance report notes that 80% of the district's teaching force identifies as white, while 80% of the student population does not. This demographic difference between teachers and students has an undeniable impact on the daily experiences of students in WWP schools. Because many people who become teachers want to live or work in their hometown, I would like to see an effort in our district similar to the Grow Your Own programs that have been successful in diversifying teacher populations and producing effective teachers elsewhere. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to our forthcoming panel discussion. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Wait for Dr. Nathan. Oh, candidate, wait one second, can you restart that? That's on me. <laughs> candidate number 10. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for considering my application to become a board member. My interest in this position stems from a desire to support this school district in maintaining its mantle of excellence by continuing to grow, change, and innovate into the future. I believe that my experiment, experience and my temperament will enable me to successfully contribute to our school district achieving its strategic goals to give every child the tools they need to succeed in life. Much of my professional background, as well as my community involvement, has leveraged and sharpened my analytic compromise and collaboration skills. In my professional capacity as a lawyer and contracts manager, I negotiate contracts and work with corporate clients and internal partners to balance business risk with client demands and legal and regulatory requirements. As a member of the West Windsor Human Relations Council for the past six years, the last two as chairperson, I collaborated with our members and other local groups to organize community building events, including MLK Day, International Peace Day, and Cultural Awareness Day. I'm also a proud member of a local chapter of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, an organization that brings together Muslim and Jewish women across the US to build bridges and fight hate and prejudice. Like everyone here, I would come with some of my own interests and opinions about many of the issues the school district has to address. Virtual learning, police in the schools, homework, teacher salaries, to name a few. Certain topics can be very emotional. And when we're dealing with issues that we're passionate about, it's easy to dig in and jump to conclusions. Let me assure you that I understand and would value and accept the role of a board member, not to push my agenda, but to be an advocate for the school district by making the best decisions I can based on the information provided to us. As I noted in my letter of interest, it is my strong desire to contribute to the mission of the district and help create a safe, healthy, rich, and inclusive learning environment for all students. And if I'm selected for this position, I would look forward to learning from and collaborating with the rest of the board and the administration to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number five. Good evening. My name is Dennis Krasnogutsky. I'm an educator, musician, scholar, and a father. I have taught at New Jersey's middle and high schools. I have been professor at colleges and universities, and currently hold an administrative position in a nonprofit organization in New York City entitled New York Institute for the Humanities and Social Studies. Education has, is, and will be central to my life and professional activities. Hence the reason I would like to offer my knowledge, my experience, my expertise, especially in the fields of arts and humanities to the community I live in. I view the K through 12 education as being perhaps the most important to the development and growth of future generations who will write the history of the humanity. The quality of the education determines the course of humanity. In addition, the cumulative plethora of knowledge that comes with the high school diploma should be a solid foundation and a pillar to the educational efforts to follow. The rapid changes in global economy had prompted global shift towards innovation and technological development. 
the national focus had shifted towards the STEM subjects, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This shift to STEM-focused education has challenged the role of the humanities in American education, pushing the arts, humanities, and human sciences to the side of American classrooms. And while our technological achievements had skyrocketed over the past 200 years, the ethical and moral aspects of our collective growth had seen very little change for the past 2,000 years. The humanities strengthened our global view, broadened our intellectual foundation, teach us to communicate clearly, help us to develop creative and critical thinking skills, teach us to be problem solvers, create engaged citizens and thinkers, reinforce cultural and ethical responsibilities and values, help us to understand the impact that science, technology, and medicine have had on society. Uh, the arts represent complex ideas, often conveyed with simplicity and aesthetic frisson, and generate interpretations and analysis that may stretch far beyond the original intentions of the creators. And I do hope that my expertise in the area would be an asset to this board. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, candidate number eight. Good evening, my name is Grace Power. Um, before I talk a little bit about my interest in serving on the board, I just wanted to take a minute to sincerely thank the superintendent, the members of this board, and especially the teachers. I know the past two years have been very difficult as a parent, and I can only imagine um, how much stress this has put on our board to make you know, good decisions that balance the needs of the students, um, the parents, um, and of course also the teachers who've actually had to implement those um, those constant changes. Um, throughout, I have just been utterly impressed with the professionalism, the dedication, um, and the care that I've seen from our teachers. Nothing is perfect, but I think as a district, you know, we have a lot to be proud of. Um, like probably every parent in West Windsor, I moved here because we have exceptional schools. Um, and with, with few exceptions, like I really have not been let down, and I've, I've been so thankful um, to have two children that are going through the school system uh, since kindergarten. One is at community in sixth grade, and the other is in village at, in fourth grade. Um, public schools have really shaped me throughout my life. They hold a very special place to me um, in my heart. Um, I'm a three-time graduate of Rutgers University and uh, attaining a master's degree and a law degree. Um, I believe that education can really open a lot of doors. Professionally, I do serve as an attorney as VP of Regulatory Affairs. Um, I'm a member of our senior, senior management team. Previously, I served in state government as chief of staff at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, so our five-member board, where I led the day-to-day -day management of the state agency that regulates investor-owned utilities and formulates the state's clean energy um, policy. Um, in that role, I was really humbled to work on some serious uh, and, and important issues that would really shape the future. Um, and since joining the private sector, I've been looking for new opportunities to give back. Uh, in the past, I've served as a Girl Scout leader. Uh, this fall, I uh, had a lot of fun serving as an assistant cheer coach. Um, but I still sort of feel myself looking for more to give back um, more. As an attorney, I believe that I bring um, an analytical skill uh, and a, a critical eye to issues. I'm very open-minded. Um, I don't pretend to know everything about educational policy, but if I am selected, I pledge to learn everything that I can, learn from my board members, respect you, respect our educators, um, and just continue to um, help shape our district and you know, continue to really be a proud parent of students that attend here. Um, again, I just wanna thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I've, I've submitted my, um, my resume and letter that uh, provide some more information, but um, I think you have a lot of good candidates to choose from tonight, and I am very uh, honored to be one of those members. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move into the questions that the Board of Education uh, has determined will be asked of each candidate. Uh, will we, in changing the order, we will go with candidate number one, and the first question is two parts. Part one. What is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? And part two, 
is what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concern about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Uh, please provide a specific example. So I think um, the initiative that is really working well is this whole um, managing the virtual um, setup in school. I think the way the, um, uh, the teachers were already trained and they were given tools to help students achieve uh, learning via virtual learning was, was amazing. Um, as I said, I have twin boys, and initially they were having issues connecting uh, to an, an understanding that medium of learning, but once the teachers got more involved, I, I felt like they had a connect and they were able to um, learn uh, almost as good as if they were in class. Um, the, the second uh, initiative around uh, what needs improvement is, is, uh, is a perception of communication, I feel. I think the district communicates really well. I personally love those long emails from uh, Dr. Aderhold. <laughs> 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 and um, and I, the reason I say emails because I feel um, I can always go back, search the content that was in those emails, and forward it to to folks. And um, if, if they ask me questions, um, so I personally li like that. But I've seen uh, on various chats and various groups the perception of some communication uh, feels that it's not enough or it's not um, timely, and. I want to help bridge those gaps where I'm, I'm able to um, create a perception where all the information is available, we just need to look for it and we need to maybe use social media to send out small snippet of that information. I've already seen in last few months, uh, last few weeks, that are, uh, how much? How much so minute? yes, so uh, the oh. questions are 60 seconds. Oh, sorry. So that was, we, we're getting the cl clock set. Yeah, so I was like, set. wow. <laughs> no, you, 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 I didn't want to, I didn't want to cut yeah, you yeah, off. Yeah, all right. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that'll help me so I can see and wrap up. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, and, and my sincere apologies. No, no uh, worries, about no worries. That. Uh, Candidate number six, the same two-part question. Part one, what is one district initiative you believe has been done well? Part two. What is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about, or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. Well, um, in terms of the district initiative that was done well, I, I think we were all very impressed by the, the quick pivot to um, online learning. But I think the thing that made that possible was a lot of groundwork that was laid prior to that um, and in particular, the fostering of um, learning management systems, particularly Google Classroom, at least in, 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 the, in our, child's, our children's uh, classrooms. Um, I think that particular shift was much harder than people gave it credit for. And, and I think it, it, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It was something that um, many teachers had to be persistent about uh, and, and administrators had to be persistent about. Um, in terms of one district initiative that I would, that I have, uh, uh, you know, I'm hesitant about. Um, I think that as strong as, you know, I'm just going to say the one that. Oh, am you I, finish I, your thought. Oh, oh please. The, the the thing I, I still don't understand the football lights. To be honest with you, right? Like so so it, it seemed to me that there was a push to to say we don't want those, but then they came anyway. And so that, the push and pull of how that happened is still a bit of a mystery to me. So that's something that I would want more information about. Thank you very much. Okay, candidate number 10, same two part questions. Part one, what is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? Part two, what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about, or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. Thank you. Uh, I believe one that was done well, that I was very happy about, uh, was from the strategic initiative to um, focus on the emotional well-being of the student and not just on, um, you know, on, on the whole student, not just on the grades and the testing um, and the push to, uh, to get it to uh, the best colleges. While that's still very important, you know, focusing on the whole child, um, as far as Initiatives that could use additional work. Um, 
I believe, and this is a personal issue, so um, thinking about the transition from third to fourth grade, looking at homework, um, grading in terms of, it seems like it's a very uphill battle, right? You know, very, very different. And it would be nice to have a little more gradual and a little more preparation. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number five. Same two questions. Part one, what is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? Part two, what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. One initiative that I could really compliment the district on is the excellence in the music program throughout the district, through all the schools. Um, I've known some of the teachers personally, some have retired since, um, that did an outstanding, truly outstanding job and outstanding work with students and I had the privilege of observing them uh, conduct lessons and conduct orchestral sessions. Organization, that means uh, that administrators really did a fantastic job hiring that particular staff members who knew uh, what we were doing. I really would like to have more information on the arts within the school district. Thank you. Thank you. And candidate number 11, same two-part question. Part one, what is one district initiative you believe has been done well? And part two, what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. So I believe that um, the district's initiative towards equity is something that I think is working very well. In addition to having an equity officer, I know the district is taking strides in um, making sure that curriculum and resources that are utilized are really inclusive um, and the materials that students are reading um, and participating in are really well thought through um, to make sure that it affects all students. An area that I think that continues to need improvement is the communication um, with parents, specifically in the area of special education. I know recently during a special education review, one of the issues that did come up was making sure that parents understood the processes um, and the guidelines and the law. So I think that is one area that you know, we can continue to um, develop um, and maybe even train the educators on how well to deal with parents. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Russo. Okay, question number two. Oh, no. Oh, I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Same two-part question, part one. All right, um, thank you. So first I wanna um, thank this district for um, the past three weeks. The, the half day option I think is a really balanced, smart approach that other districts have not necessarily taken um, that balances the um, need to have kids in school um, and, and I, you know, the, um, but also the safety issues, right, of, of taking off the masks. Um, I, I thought that was a very innovative approach and it struck a really good balance. Um, one of the things that I would um, like to get more information about is, is um, how we um, decide when our schools start. I think that this is a very forward-thinking district and um, I've read a lot about um, other forward-thinking districts that are um, looking at starting school, school times looking at starting school later uh, as kids are older. Um, in this district, we do the opposite. There's a lot of um, scientific and psychological benefits um, for children. Uh, as they get older, they do need more sleep. Um, they do better on tests. Uh, they're better at, at driving. Um, so I'd, I would love to uh, see if that's something that the district would look into. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to question number two. Again, 60 seconds. Uh, please describe, I'm oh, sorry, candidate number six. Please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Um, some of the most, so I've been a department chair at a, at a university and in, in that role I've had to you know, make decisions, um, and even <clears throat> recently, you know, as members, you know, making tenure decisions, for example. 
um, is something that, that I've had to do. Um, and I think the most important part of making any difficult decision is genuinely listening and, and asking myself the question, if I'm wrong, how would I know, right? Like I have this, I have this very strong belief of, of if I'm wrong, what, what evidence would convince me otherwise? Um, and you know, I've, been sit, I've, I've sat around a table with five other individuals and we disagreed quite a bit about the, you know, how to proceed with a particular personnel action. Um, and, and I think in order to make that decision, we ha there's compromise is necessary, but listening to understand others' perspectives is key to that. Thank you. Candidate number 10, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Uh, at work, I am a manager for three other individuals. And um, there are times um, when we certainly don't all agree. Um, and for example, when um, I've had to uh, make a decision to select um, one person over others, um, when everyone knows um, you know, I'm making a decision and choosing one of the individuals uh, you know, to do a, a project, for example. Um, and so the process would be, or was, to, um, you know, have everyone go through how they would handle the project um, and then discuss what I thought was the best way to handle it um, and thank everyone for their, you know, contributions, but in this case, that we had to choose one person. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number five, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? The decision that I had to make that was quite challenging was uh, dating back a few years in regards to the accreditation. I was on an accreditation committee, and there was a certain point of discussion that was crucial uh, for the department and for the university. Um, and essentially, we, we decided to just do the democratic vote. And the decision was collectively made in accordance to the majority who voted. Okay. Thank you. Candidate number eight. Okay. Please. Oh, did I skip one? No, we're good. Okay. Candidate number eight. Uh, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Sure. I think without getting into specifics, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, without getting into specifics, I think that in the past um, I have dealt with a number of situations where we needed to decide whether to discipline or terminate or part ways with an employee. Um, and that is, is just never um, a fun conversation to have. Uh, but there are so many legal considerations, uh, especially if you're dealing with a union. Um, there are, you know, obviously just um, implications for morale um, and implications on fairness. Uh, in those situations, I would, um, you know, make a recommendation, come to it with, with all of the facts, um, you know, ask myself, is this the right decision? Challenge myself um, and address the concerns that others had, um, but ultimately, um, I think that usually those decisions were always in the best interest of, of everyone involved, um, no matter how difficult. Thank you. Candidate number 11, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process that you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? So as a school psychologist, I often work in teams, especially with um, administrators and teachers when it comes to discipline issues. And oftentimes, uh, my role is to advocate for the student while administrators and other educators may have um, a different perspective. So the way I deal with it is really to be an active listener, to hear all sides and points, but to also um, stick to the law and the facts that I have 
and to effectively communicate those with all that are around. I think it's important when working with a group that everyone keeps a growth mindset to really be able to take in information, analyze it, and then in the situations that I've been, the ultimate goal is to always do what's best for the student. So that is a constant reminder that I bring up. And um, I think being respectful, even if you disagree, and coming to consensus is what's really important and has been. Thank you. And finally, <laughs> candidate number one. Please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Sure. So um, as, a, as a manager in a financial firm, um, I, have to, um, I have to approve a lot of initiatives, technology initiatives um, that need funding um, for, for making sure that our business uh, grows and uh, we have enough uh, uh, resources assigned to those projects. So, uh, so a lot of time what happens is I have teams that will approach me uh, with their requests, with their funding requests, and I cannot uh, approve all those requests. And the way I do uh, the process of vetting is I look at the facts, I look at uh, what are the benefits uh, the initiative will provide, what are the benefits it provides, all the stakeholders that are available. And um, when I'm not able to approve all the requests, what I do is I give them a good feedback. I, give, I encourage them to try again and to maybe think out of the box and come back with a better um, solution next time. So that's how I make my decisions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The third question. Again, one minute time frame. Candidate number 10. Please describe your experience with budgets labor negotiations, multifaceted operations, or system integration technology? Can you ask the question again? Sure, <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> Please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multifaceted operations, or system integration technology. Multi, uh, the water bottle is covering it, thank you. So, multi-facility operations. So pick, I believe the board would like you to pick one. I see, could you start the timer over again? Yeah, we will, we will do that for you. Thank you. And by the way, a, a credit to everyone in the first panel. You're hearing the questions for the first time and kind of getting hit with everything cold. So, okay, we ready? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, I could probably choose a couple, but um, I guess with respect to budgets, uh, while I don't have uh, a formal finance background, um, in my past life um, in California, I was a member of the, um, I was appointed um, on the Community Development Block, block Grant um, Committee for um, our town there. And um, so we did have to review budgets, talk with the, um, the candidates who were looking to be funded. And, um, you know, we did have a few other experts involved since I wasn't, didn't have that strong background. But, um, you know, I, I followed and listened and uh, asked questions. And, and um, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number five, please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. Well, I have experience with actually all of them. Uh, which one would I have to, would you be interested in hearing specifically? Is it either or? or? It's either or, whatever you'd like to share. Well, uh, then I will share the system integration and technology experience where I uh, once had to uh, pretty much personally install an equipment in two different locations uh, on a university campus um, that would have to be synchronized for specific streaming. And um, that was quite a, quite a challenging <laughs> thing to do for, for a non, somebody who doesn't deal with technology, but with a thorough research, uh, with asking a few questions, the problem was actually a successful result. Thank you. Thank you.
candidate number eight. Please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. Okay. Um, in my previous role at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities as the Chief of Staff, um, I worked on um, budgets in, in a couple of important ways. First, in our actual formulation of the state's clean energy budget. Obviously, that's an important expression of the state's policy on all kinds of issues. Um, and that was, I believe, north of $600 million each year. Um, putting those documents together, getting it out to the public for comment, um, making adjustments, getting it through a board. Um, and then the other important part of our, of our budgeting was, of course, as a state-funded agency, um, our budget uh, was subject to scrutiny by the legislature, and so I would spearhead our budget um, preparation with, um, with the state treasurer, the treasurer's office, the governor's office, um, work with the, the legislature to make sure that we answered all of the legislature's questions in, in great detail, um, and of course prepare uh, the cabinet member for uh, an occasional grilling by the state legislature during the budget committee meetings. Thank you. Candidate number 11. Please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration. So my experience with budgets it really comes from the viewpoint of an educator as I have worked in a school system where we've had to uh, negotiate contracts. Um, I have been in rooms with administrators and negotiation committees where I have been fighting for or advocating for um, different sets of contracts, whether it's summer work or um, child study team separate contracts. And again, the goal is always to make sure that the resources are provided um, to give the best possible education for all students. So at times, um, we've had to go back and forth um, to make sure that that can be done in a way where all sides um, feel that it is e equal and appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Candidate number one, please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. So as, as a technologist in a financial firm, um, I think I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity to try almost all of them. Um, so I manage budgets on a daily basis. I prepare them, I monitor them, I revise them. A um, lot of budget planning happens every year, so I participate in those discussions as well. Vendor negotiation is also a part of, uh, uh, a small part of bu budget process as well. So I work with a lot of different vendors to onboard resources, to offboard resources, uh, to make sure they are giving us the best rate every year and uh, to continue building relationship with those vendors so that we can continue to get those discounts. Um, and system integration is basically, uh, we have a lot of uh, local systems and trading systems that we integrate uh, with online systems. And we, we have, as, as part of my uh, projects, we have done a lot of these integrations. And uh, so I think I'm, I've been able, I've, I have an opportunity to do all of them, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, candidate number six. Please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. So I think I will speak to the first two. Uh, those are the two that I have the, um, the most experience with. Uh, in terms of budgets on the fiscal agent on that National Science Foundation grant, as well as other previous grants, uh, $2.25 million uh, worth, which is only 1% you know, of West Windsor's budget, but still the, the idea is the same, that you have categories, you have approved vendors, you have to go through a process in order to get expenditures approved, and you also have, you're accountable for that. Um, uh, in terms of labor contracts, I'm a proud member of the American Federation of Teachers, uh, um, Shop 104, 1904, excuse me. Um, I um, am a member of our local negotiating team. Uh, where we negotiate with the local university. I've also served in statewide uh, negotiations uh, with the council for the larger state contract. Um, I have learned a lot about labor contracts in the last 15 years, things that I didn't understand as uh, sort of a, a, a lay person who's, who's trying to just under, make sense of a budget, but, but understanding the back and forth, give and take, and 
compromise. Uh, the, the notion of consensus that was mentioned earlier is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as we move to the last question, everyone can take a breath. Uh, this also has a one minute time limit. And this last question is simply an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that have you not, you've not already shared with us or anything else that you would like the board, that you'd like to offer for the board's consideration tonight. We'll start with candidate number five. I think in my initial statement, I pretty much summarized uh, my experience, my knowledge, my expertise, uh, my educational background, and specific area that I, I have strengths. What else can I say about myself? I have a, I have a very big <laughs> dog that weighs 130 pounds. <laughs> And who is waiting for me right now, probably? <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's pretty much thank, pretty much thank it. Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Candidate number eight. Uh, this last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you've not previously shared, or that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. Sure, thank you. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about my role um, in my, as chair of the 2019 New Jersey Energy Master Plan Committee. Um, really proud of, of that effort. It was an 18 month um, interagency effort coordinating cabinet members, agencies across the administration to um, chart the roadmap to achieve the state's goal of achieving 100% clean energy by 2050. It was um, a very challenging process, many, many public hearings, many considerations, many opposing viewpoints, um, but it, it was a, a really gratifying um, experience and it taught me a lot about, again, just hearing um, opposing points of view, um, really thinking about you know, the practical implications of, of policy, um, hearing from people who actually have to implement them and, and how it impacts their daily life. So I think that my goal, um, excuse me, my, my experience with implementing and formulating policy would really be a benefit um, if I was to be chosen to serve on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number 11. This last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you've not already shared or anything else you would like to offer the board, you would like to offer the board for its consideration of your candidacy. So I think that, you know, we all realize that these are unprecedented times in education. And um, as someone that is on the front lines every day during the past three years, during the pandemic, I think that I have a unique view and perspective um, from actually working with teachers and being um, with students to really see how much um, these times have been a struggle for all involved in the school community. Um, not only am I seeing the struggles firsthand, but I think that I've really seen how um, educators in the whole school community have come together to come up with so many innovative ways and creative ways to help all of our students um, and building relationships because the more that we are focusing on building relationships in schools among all of us, I think it really impacts um, not only the social emotional growth of students, but also their academic success. So I think being on the front lines and really day to day being in a school system is an advantage that I respect. Thank you very much. Candidate number one. This last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you have not previously shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. Thank you. Um, so I think I've, I mentioned in my uh, previous statement that um, I've been inspired by women around me and um, especially uh, my mom who, um, who was a stay at home mom but she used to volunteer as a teacher and she used to uh, teach under uh, underprivileged uh, girls who, who, who had no sight. So she used to invite them home and tease them. So I, I feel 
that volunteering, that appreciation of education um, drive came to me somewhere through, through that channel. And um, I've tried to continue doing that. I've volunteered at um, a Big Brother, Big Sister organizations. I've volunteered for ASHA for Education, which also serves under, uh, underprivileged uh, girls. And um, so I feel uh, that really motivates me, and, and I think uh, that's why I volunteer, and I'm currently, uh, like the PTA president um, also helps me be part of this uh, school district and the education system. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number six. This last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you have not previously shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. So I'm glad there's a time limit on this one because I would go on. Um, mm. I, th I think the one thing that I want to share is, uh, you know, we're, my, my wife is in the audience and, and, and you know, we're the parents of two kids and the, our youngest is, is a graduating senior this year. And I think the thing that I'd like to say is, you know, um, that there's more than one way to be successful in schools. I think there's a dominant sort of message that can be sent, uh, and it usually involves some expensive colleges uh, as, as the measure of success. But, you know, our daughter's in community college and she's starting a business with her partner. Our, our son is going into automotive tech school and I could not be prouder of the two of them. And, uh, and I think the, the, that if we expand what our notion of what an outcome is for education, and it's not just an acceptance into, into, into particular um, schools, if, if we see it as the creation of a whole person who can be fully human, to, to me, that's, that's a worthwhile educational outcome, and that's what I'd like to shoot for. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, candidate number 10. This last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you've not previously shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. Thank you. I think the last thing I would like to share is uh, more focused on uh, uh, myself as a communicator um, and someone who can, who I believe I could bring people together, in particular uh, working on teams. I'm thinking of an example um, in a past life, uh, and I do the same at my current job, but in one of my previous jobs, uh, where I, working on teams to try to uh, implement new products and services and sort of translating, in air quotes, uh, between the engineers and the business teams and the legal teams and helping this be that person who's the bridge, say, to make sure everyone understanding uh, each other and we're hitting all the right points um, and so we can get the work done. Thank you very much. Thank you to the entire panel. Uh, as I said before, you guys had this tough, tough job. First one's up, uh, but I, I, everybody did, did very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take a brief five minute recess, let everyone stretch. Uh, everyone needs a bio break. Uh, we'll change out the nameplates and be ready with the second panel.
to get inside. Well, the first person I called in, because I didn't go back, yeah. she wasn't set. Yeah. No, then I just said, I didn't say. Write down what time we stop. I didn't look. Well, it was about five. I just said about five. Right? No, I don't think it was. Okay. No, I actually don't. I didn't write down the time. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs>
All right, we could uh, just start to come back. Everyone could please just take their seats. Uh, oh, four. Is candidate 12 here? Okay. All right, just, uh, just for everyone's uh, notice, uh, candidate 12 uh, did uh, have every intention of being here tonight, but did send an email that they may have to uh, be called out of town uh, for uh, pressing matters for work. Uh, so it appears that that, that has happened. Uh, so we will have the, the, the four panelists, and, but a candidate 12, its candidacy is still uh, is, is still open. So, uh, good evening, panel number two. Uh, welcome. Uh, we'll start with an opening statement of three minutes, uh, and we will start with candidate number nine. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, last set of candidates that were here. I absolutely love hearing your story. Do you mind just pulling the yeah. mic down so that the yes? Can you hear me? Yes. And the last set of candidates are absolutely amazing because I loved hearing their story. I was glued to their personal story. Uh, even if I don't get selected, I will be happy to go home learning that I can competed with these other candidates. Uh, um, my name is Ruhul Kuris. Uh, I have been a resident of West Windsor since 2005. I have three girls in fifth, seventh, and 11th grade. Uh, this is my 12th year with the school district. I feel lucky to have the opportunity to raise my children in a great community like West Windsor. I grew up in Northern Virginia's Fairfax and Alexandria school districts. Even though those are great school districts, my experience in West Windsor has been far better. Why? Because of the sense of community. A community where I can where I know the mayor, a community where I know the superintendent, a community where I know the school board members. They all played an integral role in my girls' lives, especially Girl Scout, and I'm thankful of that for all of you who were who, who are here earlier. My personal passion is in entrepreneurship. I've been an entrepreneur at heart since I started my first job building robots to do surgery, and that was back in the late 1990s. Since I graduated from Wharton, I started two software companies. Recently, I've come to familiarize myself with some of the innovation in education sector, also known as ed tech. I outlined three areas where I can be helpful. Reviewing projects from a financial perspective, the Wharton education gave me that perspective. Identifying how entrepreneurship can better prepare, our, on, better prepare our students and how to improve collaboration amongst students. Now, you can ask me, how do I know my community? How well do I know my community as well? I've come to know them through activities of my girls in Girl Scout, Girl Choirs, and number of sports like soccer. But I also helped organize a group of 120 dads participating in soccer, where we come together every Sunday, every week of the year for the last 10 years. And this is where we learn about and, and share problems and share challenges and learn about each other. And this is how I know the communities so well. And this includes members from both 
West Windsor and Plainsboro. Based on my experience, based on what I see coming in artificial intelligence and education, I believe technology and entrepreneurship will play a tremendous role in our children's future, both in their careers and in how we deliver education to the children. If you With could my humble experience, I want to help our students better prepare for this new future. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate number seven. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, thank you to the board and uh, to Dr. Adderhold, the community, the public, the teachers, uh, for this opportunity to speak in front of you today and present myself as a candidate. My name is Samantha Figueroa Latif. Um, and I would like to serve West Windsor and the Board of Education. Um, as outlined in my letter of intent, I have substantial ties with this community and the school district. Um, in fact, I moved here with my family when I was 13, and I went to high school at High School North when it was a pretty new school. Um, after completing my education here in West Windsor, I went on to um, earn my undergrad degree at Rutgers, and I moved back to Plainsboro with my fiance and daughter. Um, my oldest daughter, who is now a senior in high school North herself, um, went to school here in West Windsor Plainsboro School District from kindergarten, and uh, we lived in Plainsboro in the Ravens Crest community for many years. She participated in many activities, sports, um, Girl Scouts, soccer. So I've had my hand um, in, <clears throat> in those things uh, as a student myself here, also as a parent. Um, a little over a year ago, we purchased a home in West Windsor. Um, my husband and I are enjoying home ownership uh, for the most part, <laughs> um, aside from the HVAC repairs that we um, faced this summer. Um, we live in the Old Mills Farms community, right across from Grover Mills Pond. Uh, that is a really lovely, lovely community. It's very tight-knit. There's a WhatsApp group that we, uh, we joined, um, and it's the kind of place where neighbors give each other old books and toys, um, and there's really a beautiful communal feeling there. And um, where I am now in my life, in my career, uh, as an attorney, having completed law school and um, gotten to the point where I'm beginning to open my own practice, I thought about ways that I can c give back to the community um, that I trusted with my, my, with my daughter when I was a young mom. Um, and uh, I want to be a part of that for my younger two children. I have a four-year-old and a nine-month-old, so I'm, I'm pretty crazy. <laughs> um, but we could not be happier with this community and we plan to, on staying here forever. So I want to uh, contribute in a, in, on the next level here um, now that I'm in a position to do so. Um, I think I'm in a unique position. Do you want to finish your thought? Yeah, I, I think I'm in a, a unique position to contribute having attended school here, having had a daughter that attended school here, and now um, having two young children that um, will be attending school here for the next two decades. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Candidate number three. Hi, I'm um, humbled to be here, and I can't believe the candidates tonight. You guys have amazing people to choose from, so that is wonderful. Good evening, my name is Laura Cohen, and I am interested in filling Mr. Whitfield's position on the board. I have lived in West Windsor for 14 years. I have three children who have attended the public schools, uh, one of whom is currently a student at Grover. Over the years, I have attended uh, Board of Ed meetings and expressed my thoughts. I have also emailed Mr. Dr. Adderhold and the board uh, to raise my concerns about the needs of the students. I have knowledge of the history of the board over the past 10 years, and I have been engaged and informed about the major decisions that have been made during that time. I believe the primary role of a board member is to represent the concerns of the community, and in particular, the parents and the students to the school administrators, as well as to explain the needs of the students and the teachers to the people of West Windsor and Plainsboro. 
In that way, the board members act as an important bridge to the community at large and the school system. I'm here tonight because I believe it, it is important that the members of the school board be active in the community. I am a familiar face in town and at our local schools, uh, whether it is working on projects with the PTA, volunteering as a class parent, being on the sidelines of soccer, lacrosse, baseball, volunteering for Girl Scouts, or just being the neighbor who organizes the block parties. I am regularly talking with parents and neighbors about our children and the educations our schools provide. And I also have a background in law, which will aid me in serving the board uh, with my analytical thought process and my communication skills. I am interested and open to different perspectives on education, and I have already learned so much from the diverse viewpoints of our district. Over the years, I have also developed close relationships with many of our teachers. I have great respect for them and the administrators of our schools. We have an incredible staff, and I would love to support them in their efforts to provide the best education to our kids, setting them on a path for a lifetime of success. I strongly feel that the foundation for the success is built when students, parents, teachers, and administrators have an open dialogue, clear and strategic goals, and a transparent understanding of the process. I hope to serve as a channel of communication to help maintain trust and the support from the community. A critical issue which I would like to focus on as a board member would be class size and student-teacher ratios. From my own experience as a parent, as well as discussion with the teachers in our schools, I believe the number one obstacle preventing our teachers from executing their jobs at the highest level is managing the sheer number of children that attend our schools. And I'd like to thank everyone for their time and Thank you very much. Finally, candidate number two. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you again to the board for allowing us to be here this evening. Um, I could uh, go on and basically just reiterate everything everybody said, but I won't do that. Um, basically, for me, it boils down to I'm just simply a dad who loves his daughter more than anything in life, and I'm here because I want to contribute to the school system that she is in. Uh, she's currently a freshman. Uh, at High School North on the fencing team. Uh, and we went to our match today and they won, it was great. Um, and I love just being a part of everything that she does. So I, I'm, my goal in life is to really volunteer in as many avenues of life that I can. Um, currently, I'm also an attorney. I think we have a bunch of them here tonight. <laughs> I thought I was gonna be the only one. Um, but uh, on top of that, I'm also an adjunct for uh, a college online and also a small business owner that I run with my daughter as well. Uh, my educational background, I have a bachelor's and a master's in criminal justice, as well as obviously a JD. Um, I have a master's in law and also an MBA, which is pending uh, commencement. Uh, so education for me is very important. Uh, it's actually very addicting uh, as you get older because you just get this thirst for knowledge uh, and you just want to really learn as much as you can. So it's, it's really my goal to kind of pass on that thirst to other students because growing up as a child, I didn't have that understanding. I didn't, I didn't do well in high school because I didn't really know how to pay attention, how to really soak up the information around me. So as I got older, I understood the changes you have to make and the different ways you need to look at information to really understand the world around you. So ultimately, I just want to see that same success in students. Even though this is a great school system, we have great results, we have great scores, I just want to see the students from this school system go out into the world and just say they went to high school north or high school south and people already know, how, oh, hey, this is a high caliber student. This person you know, needs to get this job just simply because of where they went to school and went where they went to high school. So that's why I'm here um, and I'll give back the rest of my time to the board, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to shift into the four questions. Each one is a one minute time frame. Just wait till we get set. Okay, starting with <laughs> candidate number seven. This is the two part question. Part one, what is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? And part two, what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about 
or an initiative that you would like additional information on, please provide a specific example. And the timer is not an initiative. <laughs> um, Go ahead. I, I, I have a minute here. Go ahead. Yes. That's a hard job. So it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the initiatives that I think that West Windsor Plainsboro um, has, has taken on that I'm really impressed with is the curriculum um, that is, has been uh, implemented in the high schools. My daughter has a wide array of classes that she's taking, including forensic science. Um, and I really think that it is very similar to what a college uh, education has to offer. And it gives her a lot of preparation for that. So I've been really impressed with that. And it's very different and, um, from what I experienced when I went to high school at, in, in West Windsor. Um, the one initiative that I, I think needs some improvement or I would like to get more information about is the nutritional um, initiative as far as what's offered in school lunches. Um, that is something that I, I think that we could do better as a community and, and as a school district. Thank you. <clears throat> Candidate number three. It's a two-part question. What is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? What is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. So what I think they've done great is adding to the schools. I'm so happy to see more classrooms, more labs. The kids need them so badly. I've spent a lot of time in the schools and I know how crowded those classrooms are and those hallways are. It is unbelievable, and so I'm so glad to see these massive additions to the schools. That is wonderful. Um, and uh, what I actually have an issue with that nobody else seems to is the curriculum. Um, my daughter in the third grade was on the computer the whole year and didn't put pen to pencil, pen to paper at all, and it was kind of a, a eye-opening experience for me, and I actually spoke to the woman doing the timers in the back about the curriculum, um, I believe, um, uh, and it was, it was a learning experience for me to, and, and for her to figure out how to do online learning properly with an eight-year-old, and uh, I think they lost a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. I know improvements have been made in that area, but uh, I think the curriculum third, fourth grade needs to focus on uh, just basic reading and writing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Candidate number two. First part, what is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? And what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and as I had stated in my interest letter, one of the uh, things that really uh, caused me to uh, grow interest into the board is uh, when we first moved here, my daughter had an incident of bullying, and uh, it was investigated immediately. You know, action was taken. The seriousness of the incident was greatly shown, and that was something I was highly impressed with coming from different uh, school systems where it wasn't given as, as much importance. Um, so I think that's, that's something that's uh, really doing well. Uh, one thing that I have reservations with um, is also the, the lunch uh, situation. Uh, just seeing, I know there's been changes due to COVID and the different type of options of hot food and cold food that needs to be offered currently to, to stay safe. But uh, from seeing the photos my daughter sent me, uh, it doesn't look too appetizing or too, uh, too healthy at any point. Uh, so that's something I would like to dig into. Okay, thank you. Candidate number nine, two-part question. What is one district initiative that you believe has been done well? And the second part, what is one district initiative that you have reservations or concerns about or an initiative that you would like additional information on? Please provide a specific example. The one that you guys hit out of the ballpark was the transition in 2020, March 15th, to online. I mean, that was incredible the way you transitioned from a, from an ongoing in-person class to complete online, that was fabulous. I think you guys did such a great job and it, it did so well 
that I, even though online learning is not best for a lot of students, my daughters actually love the idea of going to school half day. That, that, uh, so you guys did a really good job in terms of transitioning, adapting to online learning. The part where I have, uh, where I think you guys could do a better job, or I think uh, um, much more needs to be done, is in concussions uh, and, 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 and in sports. The reason I say it is my daughter went through uh, three concussions, and um, I don't believe the personnel are well trained enough to pick up concussions uh, at the sports level. So I think it could be improved in terms of how uh, um, coaches and other personnel identify the concussion. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to question number two, starting with candidate number three. Please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? So I would go back to my experience uh, as a lawyer. I um, did a lot of hiring and training of employees and uh, I would have disagreements about hiring decisions. And I think the most important thing is to be open-minded, to listen to other people's viewpoints. I think that's something that I've learned living in West Windsor. Um, there are so many different people from all different places in the world and different backgrounds and different uh, viewpoints. And I think it's really important to be open-minded and to continue to listen to our neighbors and friends, as, especially with the well-being of all of our students in mind. Thank you. Candidate number two, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Sure, so I will also uh, go back to, uh, I previously clerked for a judge in Warren County and as part of that job, I had to handle all mediations prior to them going before a judge. Um, so the sheer nature of the situation was handling a disagreement between both parties. Um, and in that situation, you learn how to just listen to both sides and really just offer a middle point that nobody's really kind of seeing. Um, and in every situation, there's usually an opportunity for both parties to meet, but both sides are really kind of sticking to their guns. They want this, they want that. An optimal situation is when everybody leaves a little bit disgruntled because everybody's getting a little bit of what they need. Um, so it just allowed me to build skills in, in listening and, and really just analyzing situations and how to fix people's lives without them really seeing the end result. Thank you. Candidate number nine, please describe a situation which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? Uh, um, I, you know, while building my company, while, uh, I faced a number of times where I had to make difficult decisions with respect to personnel, with respect to cutting down uh, in the number of employees um, uh, to meet the budget. But these are, these are where you actually learn to pra uh, utilize the skill set, but you learn this skill set from a very basic things in terms of how to deal with your kids. Uh, if I have three daughters and they're oftentimes uh, they're in a disagreement, but you, the key thing you have to do is to listen to them. Listen to them, then after you understand all perspective and figure out how to communicate, position it properly such that they understand what the principle that should guide the thing. And that, that's basic, and you learn that from a family school, but it's actually employable at a, at a, in, a, in a business environment where I had to start a company and, actual, uh, and, 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 and deal with cutting employees. Thank you. Candidate number seven, please describe a situation in which you had to make a difficult decision as a member of a team. What was the process you used to make the decision? How did you handle any disagreements? I encounter um, this kind of circumstance a lot in, in my work as a family law attorney. Um, mediation is a big part of my practice, uh, what I do. Um, so the way that I deal with those situations is by trying to identify points of agreement amongst people um, and using that to uh, be at the forefront 
of any discussion. Um, and I think uh, coming up with creative solutions to address the real, per, um, the real differences that people have with always going back to the points of agreement um, through a, that mediation process. That has been very successful for me as a mediator and also as an advocate participating in a mediation, which is something that I do very frequently on a daily basis, pretty much. So. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the third question. Candidate number two. Please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I, I guess I'll touch on the budgets aspect. Uh, during law school, I served as the president of my school's um, Black Law Students Association, um, and with this responsibility came uh, the onus of um, overseeing the budget, along with the treasurer. Um, and I had the unique idea of, for all our expenses, finding a way for someone else to pay for it instead of us. <laughs> um, so that allowed <laughs> for us to have more money to do what we wanted to do at the end of the year. Uh, so through sponsorships and, and allowing people to come and speak and you know pitch their ideas or whatever, at the end of the year we had a huge surplus which we were able to just pour back into the organization, increase our study library and uh, increase all the resources that we need to kind of study for the bar and not have to put that uh, burden on uh, the seniors graduating uh, or the three L's graduating. Um, so ideally, uh, the best way to handle a budget is to just find someone else to pay for it. <laughs> Thank you. Candidate number nine, please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. Uh, starting a business requires prudent use of budget. Uh, you have to understand how to best utilize the money you have on hand, because you will have multiple projects at hand but you have to choose, figure out how to choose the right project which will best, uh, best give you return on your investment. So with respect to that, we had to keep an eye on our goal keep an, and ensure that we were able to break, uh, choose a project that will give us the best return on investment, but also implement that project in a way such that we reduce or minimize the risk, meaning that figure out how to break down the project with respect to risk and implement it for, uh, implement it with respect to reducing the risk as much as possible uh, with the focus strategy. Thank you. Candidate number seven, please describe your experience with budgets, labor negotiations, <laughs> timers, <laughs> I'm teasing, <laughs> multi-facility operations, or system integration technology. Uh, so once again, um, I am a family law attorney. Um, big part of my practice is addressing budgetary limitations on a on a very small scale within a family. Uh, when they are go when people are going through that transition, I have to help them figure out how they're going to make a two income household um, break up in, to support two two separate households. Um, that's a that's something that requires a lot of thought um, and the guiding principle behind that in me helping um, my clients and people that I'm mediating in case for is the best interest of the children and keeping that in mind when trying to figure out how we can make um, two incomes uh, spread, up, spread to support two separate households. That's something that I deal with on, again, a daily basis. Thank you. Candidate number three. Thank you. I, you don't have to repeat the question. Okay. Um, no, okay. it's good. Um, I'll just wait for the time. So okay. um, as I'll speak to budgets as well. Um, way back in my professional experience, I worked in advertising, and I got to spend budgets. And so that was spend. <laughs> I had a budget to spend um, of Nissan and Infinity Dollars all over uh, TV and radio, because uh, internet wasn't really happening then. Um, but so I had to be responsible for it and, um, and uh, be uh, accountable for it. 
And I think that's something that the board has to be accountable to the citizens of this of these two towns. And uh, it's extremely important. And another important thing about being accountable is um, in my legal experience, when I graduated from law school, it was sort of the post Enron era. So there was it was just accounting fraud upon accounting fraud. And I worked on on cases where I had to learn all about reading the financial documents and the accounting documents and looking for fraud, looking for problems. And so I am familiar with financial documents and um, hopefully not finding any problems here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we've come to the last question. Candidate number two. The last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experience that you have not previously shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. Sure, uh, so I also serve as a volunteer, uh, as a member on the uh, intensive supervision program for the state of New Jersey. And this involves, uh, you know, we interview currently incarcerated individuals looking to come back into society and I represent the community. Um, a high proportion of the individuals are young people, um, you know, 18 to 22 range who've just made stupid decisions just based on not having the proper guidance, the proper instruction, the proper school system, proper anything. And these are fully capable individuals who just have made bad decisions. Um, so my heart kind of bleeds out for them and it also wants to ensure that our students have that same, have the guidance and instruction that they need to make those proper decisions going forward. Um, it just takes one you know, wrong decision to really ruin a student's life. And I wanna do everything I can to ensure that that situation doesn't happen. Thank you. Candidate number nine. The last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you've not already shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. I'm an entrepreneur. That means I like to look at challenges from a different perspective and find an innovative solution towards it. And in the same manner, I, I am a, a, I love mentorship, but I don't go to the typical route to do mentoring. But I, I find a way to help other people. For example, I've helped a mother, West Windsor mother, change her, uh, change her career or take her through a career transition. I was with her for three years, and I was successfully able to help her transition from one industry to, bec to uh, becoming an executive at Amazon. I also, through my soccer experience, I also find a way to mix with people from different socioeconomic background, even though West Windsor is pretty wealthy. There, I have an opportunity to help fathers talk to their daughters about the college process and how to, how to make sure, how to be motivated about uh, uh, sending their daughters to college. And so these are innovative ways I find and uh, solve challenges. Thank you. Candidate number seven. This last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences you have not already shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy. So one thing that I didn't mention, but I did uh, include in my letter of, in, of intent, um, is that my uh, family, my husband owns um, two small businesses. Uh, he owns restaurants, one of them here in um, Plainsboro, the concession on the uh, golf course. And um, us being very, a, a young couple, young parents, um, we, I was intimately involved in that. Um, in addition to working as a lawyer, um, I'm starting my own practice as, a, as I mentioned earlier. So um, we, are, uh, we are very intimately involved and invested in this community. Um, and I have, uh, ha have had some experience with adjusting to the change in the restaurant industry as one of the things that um, we help to work with changing our budget, changing our, our vendors, and adjusting and adapting to the times. And I think that that is another skill that I could bring to the board. Thank you. Lastly, candidate number three. The last question is an opportunity for you to share anything about your background or relevant experiences that you have not previously shared that you would like to offer for the board's consideration of your candidacy? I just uh, would like to add that, um, you know, my children have been involved in many different things with the school system and um, interface with many different kinds of teachers. And I think that I, we have such a unique school district with so many different interests. And I, 
really hope all of those continue. Uh, I know there's a big emphasis on getting back into sports and um, normalcy for the kids, but all of the clubs and the plays and the, the things that the kids need the most after school activities and sports, I really hope those continue and I hope um, because there's so many kids that aren't involved in sports and really need to have that in-person interaction with their, uh, their, their, their co-students. And um, so I hope those continue. And um, it's just something that I'm passionate about because I, my son isn't into sports. <laughs> but I, that's all I'd add. Thank you very much. As with the first panel, all of you did a great job. Thank you for coming out. Uh, <laughs> So um, in order to facilitate the next, the next transition, the board has to be reseated to make a motion to go into executive closed session. So thank you again to all of our candidates, and we'll explain next steps when we get up to the, to the, to the desk. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I, I think, um, I'm sure I can speak for all the board members to say that was amazing to really listen to all of you candidates. Thank you so much for coming out here and for, of course, applying for this, this position. Uh, I know we're going to have a really difficult decision ahead of us. And I, I really, really enjoyed hearing, as you all said about each other, hearing your stories, hearing your responses. Um, I hope yeah, I, there was. You know, there's so many of you, and we you know we can only choose one. But I really hope that this isn't the last time that we see many of you. Um, really appreciate the time that you took. I know it's a long night, but I know personally, I'm sure I speak for our board members that we enjoyed the process. We enjoyed listening to your answers, and uh, uh, we, you know, we will. It will not be an easy decision. <laughs> so, um, so we are going to recess into closed executive session uh, to debrief uh, on these interviews. Uh, and I believe we expect that to take uh, around an hour or so. And uh, I believe in about 30 minutes, someone will come out and just update uh, uh, you know, the, all of you, if for anyone who is still here, to just update you on that process. Uh, this is live streaming, so any of you are free to stay until that, that hour is up, or you're free also to, to watch this back home. Um, so that's completely your choice. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Allen? Um, sure. Um, thank you, Ms. Juliana. Um, just again, um, again, thank you to everyone that, that was here and interviewed this evening and, and uh, appreciate your candidacies. Uh, with respect to the debrief, um, a member of the administration will come out in approximately 30 minutes from the time we recess um, to give an update. It's possible that we come back earlier. Uh, the board may make a motion um, for an opportunity to name a new member. Again, should someone be named to the Board of Education tonight, there's a process that that individual will have to go through in the next 30 days with respect to a background check um, and fingerprint clearance um, before they're allowed to be sworn in to the Board of Education. That's a, that's a state rule, so just want to make sure the public understands that the board member will be, um, could be appointed this evening, but they won't be seated as a member of the board, as a voting member of the board until they go through that next process. That should take about 30 days with a state process. So. Um, the earlier we can coordinate, the faster it happens. Um, uh, that uh, being said, um, Mr. Toscano, is there anything further for the community that we would need to inform them? No. Thank you. 
I need to read the statement, okay? You need to read this. We okay. need to obviously uh, read, read the resolution and then uh, motion second and we can go from there. Okay. All right, so I'll go ahead and read this uh, resolution. So whereas the Open Public Meetings Act authorizes boards of education to meet in executive session under certain circumstances, whereas the Open Public Meetings Act requires the board to adopt a resolution at a public meeting to go into private session, now therefore be it resolved by the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District Board of Education that it is necessary to meet in executive session to discuss certain items involving the Board of Education vacancy. Be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board, which need not remain confidential, will be made public as soon as feasible. The minutes of the executive session will not be disclosed until the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Be it further resolved that the board may return to open session to conduct public uh, to conduct business at the conclusion of the executive session if necessary. So can I have a motion to go into closed session? Okay, Tusha. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. We will recess the closed session. Thank you very much, everyone.
Four markers. Uh, all in favor. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All right, so I, again, I just want to reiterate, I know I said this already, but I want to reiterate again. Um, thank you all so much uh, for coming out and definitely for applying. Uh, it, it was a humbling experience actually to see so many apply, but also to, to hear how impressive everyone was and is. Um, we really hope that we continue to see everyone and again, just, from all of us, thank you for participating in this. Thank you for um, vol you know, coming out to do these interviews and, t and spending the time with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it and are, we're humbled by this experience. I think it's the first for all of us mm -hmm. uh, and we were just so impressed with everybody. So, so thank you again all so much for being here. Okay. Um, so okay, I need a motion to appoint uh, Shweta Shetty to fill the vacant board seat until December 31st, 2022. I'll make a motion. Okay. And do we have a second? I second the motion. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Okay, we'll start with Ms. Bonsall. Yes. Ms. Chinera. Yes. Ms. Ho. Yes. Ms. Krug. Yes. Ms. Maliga. Yes. Ms. Zovich. Yes. Ms. McEwen. Yes. Ms. Juliana. Yes. Thank you. Carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>